In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please be seated right here in the house of God. All right. Somebody say, a bigger shadow. shadow. We're about to cross over into a new season, but I want to just lay some groundwork. See, there's shadows everywhere. Sometimes the, the, the shadows that you're in can be disheartening. They can be challenging. You remember David's the one who, who wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. A, a, a shadow can be an, an idea. A shadow can be almost a label that you've been under your whole life. Maybe somebody when you were young uh, told you that you were less than. But God keeps on telling you that you're more than. Come on, somebody. But you can be stuck under a shadow. You know, sometimes you can, you can be stuck under the, sh- the shadow of a divorce. Just too real for Sunday morning. Sometimes you can be stuck under the shadow of an addiction. Sometimes you can be stuck under the shadow of, of poor teaching, religious ideology. Sometimes you can be stuck in the, in the shackles of religion over relationship, and it becomes a shadow over your life. I, I've heard this a thousand times. People will come to, the, come to New Heights, and they'll say, you know what, uh, sometimes I just come to your church just because I need a little boost. I said, what does that mean? I said, well, then I go back to my church. You know, I, you know I've just been there so long, and, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, we're not trying to build a church out of other people's churches, but I will say this. If, if, if you're going somewhere, come on, somebody, and the waters are never troubled. I don't mean it, I don't mean it any kind of way. I mean, if your, if your consistence is obligatory, if it's just, look, if you look around and the children of that house are not on fire for Jesus Christ, that is a massive litmus test for me. I'm not saying kids every day wake up and say, I want to go to church, but they wake up that way a lot around here. Come on, and it's not just jelly beans back there either. The pres- you can walk back into our kids' church, and you walk right back there on the, on the right Sunday, and every one of them be on their face crying under the presence of God. Come home and teach their parents some scripture. Come on, somebody talking about a litmus test. I'm talking about you can be under the shadow of an idea and not know it. You can be told that's how other people live, not how we live, and you can live under that shadow your whole life. You can live under the shadow of somebody else's insecurity your entire life. Somebody can try to stop you from shining because they're so insecure about their own position and their own abilities and you will be under the shadow of insecurity your whole life until somebody comes in with the light of Christ and says, you are more than a conqueror. Don't you live under the valley and under the shadow of death the rest of your life. Don't you live that way. You can be under a shadow and not even know it. You can wake up and and just realize why have I been sad for five years when the light of Jesus Christ has paid all of my sins? Why am I upset? You're under a shadow. It blocks the light. You can can be stuck in a, in a situation, and it could be you're, the, the, it could be somebody said it, it could be you thought it, and you're just, you're just stuck, and, and, and none of the light can get to you because of this shadow. It could be a label that you're under. Bartimaeus, you know, in those days, they had to wear, uh, they had, if they were a beggar, they had to be, they, if they were a beggar in, in biblical times, they had to be verified that their ailment was actually what they said it was. Wouldn't that change some street corners around here? They had to be verified. Bartimaeus was blind, and they would have to wear a coat that would indicate that they were blind. Now, they did a lot of things. One is it let everybody know, hey, this guy really is blind, so if you want to give, if you want to be charitable, go ahead. But the other thing it would do is it would make sure that people would give him a wide berth so that they didn't bump into him and, and maybe be nice to him or, or whatever it was, but it was an identifying factor. And one time Jesus was walking by, and Bartimaeus had been underneath this, this coat that said, I'm blind, and the Bible says that Bartimaeus started to cry, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus 
Jesus stops in his tracks and everybody sits there and says, shut up, Bartimaeus. Get back under your shadow. Come on, somebody. Get back under your coat. Shut your mouth. That's Jesus talking. He doesn't want anything to do with you. And the Bible says when they told him to shut up, he got even louder. He said, son of David, have mercy on me. In other words, he was stuck in a shadow that had labeled him for his whole life. He was stuck around a bunch of other labeled people. And one of the things that people don't like is if you start going further than they think you should. Am I preaching already? It feels like I'm just, I feel like we're just getting started in this whole bigger shadow and just already just poof, just pow. Everybody's happy with your success as long as it doesn't pass theirs. I just define social media for you. If they look at your picture and they say, oh, look at them. I remember when they were nothing. But then they see you and in their mind, you have surpassed where they think you should be. They ain't got to be all that. Why? Because they have you in a shadow of an idea of what your life should look like. Bartimaeus said, son of David, have mercy on me. I said, shut up. Jesus stopped in his tracks, said, who's that shouting over there? They said, that's Bartimaeus. They said, well, what does he want? He said, the man can't see. He said, well, bring him over to me. And, sh- and Bartimaeus took that coat and he threw it on the ground. He said, I'll never be under the shadow of my infirmity again. And he ran to Jesus and Jesus healed him on the spot. Sometimes you're just under a shadow. You're you're bound by a shadow. You're bound by an idea. You're bound by a thought process. One of the first things that has to break in your life is the power of negative thinking in your mind. Where you, you stop thinking what the world says about you and you start thinking what God said about you. Come on, God will shock you how fast he'll show up in your life if you'll get your belief in line with his book. You get your belief in line with his book, in line with his book, everything starts to shift. But the Bible also says it like this: it says, an unjust balance is an abomination to our God. So if there's some bad shadows you can get under, there's some good ones you can get under too. The Bible says we are safe, hidden in the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. You know, I I can't wait till Vision Weekend next weekend because I'm going to be sharing some things that happen that you ever, you ever had, you ever had like, like, you know, God was speaking to you and then somebody comes up and just says exactly what you were thinking. Well, this happened a lot the last month or two and to a preacher like me, like, The Bible says, my sheep know my voice and as strangers they won't follow. I know the voice of the Lord. I don't mean that in any kind of an arrogant way. I just do. So I don't need 10 confirmations to do what God tells me to do. If God said it, I believe it. Isn't that a good song? If God said it, I believe it and I'll do it. When God talks to me, he knows I'll do it. I'm not not the kind of horse that has to be kicked. I'm the one that occasionally needs to slow down. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, an old cowboy friend of mine, he told me, he said, I don't like a horse I have to pedal. You get a good horse and you're out chasing some kind of a, uh, a wild cow, you don't have to be kicking that horse the whole time. You want that horse to go. Come on, somebody. You're at New Heights Church. You're probably one of those going horses. Come on, somebody. So I don't have to have 15 different confirmations for me to do what God said because I know my father's voice, but it sure is nice when those confirmations show up. And I got some, I got some, some, some men and women of God that reached out over the last month or two. And they said, I just got to tell you this one thing. Is this, does this mean anything to you? I'm like, well, it's only exactly what I wrote down last night. And this happened over and over and over and over again. So we're stepping into a season that is ordained by God. And anything God ordains, he will follow through with. Open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 4, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 4, God, give me, give me wisdom. How do I deliver this properly, Lord? Help me with this. Isaiah 4 and 6. This is our foundation verse for a bigger shadow. This is our foundation verse for a bigger shadow. 
And there, somebody say there. There. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from heat and a place of refuge and for cover from storm and from rain. We're going to build a building. And that building is going to be not just incredible to look at, but it's going to be a tabernacle. Come on, somebody. Tabernacle is a beautiful word. It literally means a place, a meeting place for worship. We're going to build a new building. We're going to build a new tabernacle, a new meeting place for worship. And that tabernacle is going to be a shield or a refuge from the heat of the day, from the, from the harshness of society, from the harshness of racism, from the harshness of incredibly polarizing politics, from the harshness of all the negative things that are thrown at you every day, from the harshness of demonic influence on our society. It's going to be a shield and a refuge, and you're going to bring your friends and family there, and when they walk in, it's going to be like a 105-degree day, and then you get Get under the beauty of a shade tree and all of a sudden you're still in the same environment. You're just under a different shadow. We're going to build a refuge. We're going to build a place where when you bring your friends and family, their entire life changes. Sometimes you can just be in the right spot and your life change. Sometimes you can just be in the right location and your life change. Sometimes you can just be in the right moment and your life change. My father and my mom, they were at a restaurant yesterday or the day before, and they looked around and they realized that they wanted to be a blessing. So they called the waiter over and they said, I want to buy everybody's meal in the entire restaurant. How many of you know some people were just in the right spot that day? You can be in the right spot, and all of a sudden, it's a blessing. The, the, the families were walking by the table. They would never tell you this. I'm telling you this because I want to encourage you, and I want to build your faith, and I want to let you know there's a different shadow you can get under. How many of you would like to buy the meal for an entire restaurant? That's the gift of giving. That's that motivating factor that says, man, I just want to be a blessing. It's one thing to say, I want $10 million so I can have $10 million and swim in it like Scrooge McDuck. That's the world's version. There's a different version. There's another shadow you can get under where the blessing of the Lord overtakes you. Come on, somebody. Because you just, you just want to be a piece of conduit that God flows through. I'll tell you about a piece of conduit. It's very interesting. A, a, a water pipe. The, the, the purpose of the water pipe is not to get wet. It's to take a resource from one location to another. But if the water pipe is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, it stays wet the whole time. Somebody say, make me a water pipe. I, I want to be, be, be a water feature in the kingdom of God. I want to see the hand of God moving in my life. We, we were at... Uh, a little place you might recognize it, uh, Disney World this past week. And we were there, and, and somebody walked up, and they, they said, will you take our picture? And I said, no. Come on, somebody. I didn't really say that. My wife grabbed the camera, took the picture, snap, snap. They said, yeah, we just got married. I said, well, you're in the right place at the right time. I peeled off a $100 bill and handed it to them. I said, what's this for? We can't accept that. I said, well, I'm going to put it in your pocket. Stuffed it in the man's pocket. I said, be blessed, my brother. He said, what? I said, be blessed, my brother. Why? I just want it to flow in my life. I found that that the the, the fastest way to turn the value of the water is to stop the flow. You get in the mountains, you see a creek flowing, and it's nice and pretty, and it looks like it's been flowing for years. There's a better chance that you can drink from that than you can out of the, out of the, 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 the stagnant water in the side of a roadside ditch. When it flows, there's purity. And when you stop it, it begins, to, it begins to turn on itself. Come on, we're gonna get, we're gonna build a bigger shadow. Somebody say a bigger shadow. 
He said, we're, he said, he said what's going to happen is there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from heat and a place of refuge and a cover from storm and from rain. The Bible says that when, when we serve God literally, we can build a place of refuge for people. What's it going to be? You know how many times I've heard this? Our church is eight years old. We just, oh, did you guys enjoy conference last weekend? Was that fun? Whoa. The, the men of God that came and shared, they, they still hadn't stopped texting me and calling me, talking about, man, your church, it's the best church in the whole wide world to preach at. I'm like, I know. <laughs> this is the true statement. Sometimes I preach at other churches, and I sit there, and I just wish I was at New Heights. <laughs> I don't mean that any kind of way. Can we delete that from the... It's the truth, though. I sit there, I go, I wonder what's going on at New Heights. I wonder what they're singing today. I wonder what they're doing at New Heights. But what happens is, is you get, in, you get under the right shadow and everything starts to change. We went to another place. Uh, we went to another shop. And, you know, one of the things you do when you go on a little vacation is you, you shop a lot. So we're, we were shopping and whatnot. And, and there was, it was an outdoor uh, mall or, or whatever it's called. And so uh, we're walking down it, and it was real simple where I walked. I walked wherever the shade was. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Why? Because a shadow will change you. Yes. A shadow will change your circumstance. Same heat. Remember? Hebrews 11, 1, we've been teaching on it for months. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. One of the first words in that, in that verse is faith is what we stand under. When you stand under something, you get under a shadow. Come on, somebody. We're going to build a bigger shadow because what we stand under requires us to do something for the kingdom of God at a level that surpasses anything we can think or ask. That's why when you see this building next weekend, you're going to be like, what? And I'm going to be like, yeah. Yeah. Bigger than we can ask, come on somebody, or think. Because this region, if it doesn't need anything else, I'll give you some, just real quickly, some of the shadows that this region has been under. The number one, the number one shadow that I recognized when I moved to town, the Lord revealed it to me through just an amazing thing. I'll share that story sometime. But the shadow of confusion. This region has had many revivals begin to take off. And then the same thing that the devil has used since the beginning of time will, will uh, interject itself into that revival and then everybody gets confused and dissipates. The one thing that the enemy uses, almost every scenario that he can, it's real simple, real simple, it's called sin. You get a revival taken off and all the devil has to do is get the leaders of that revival to get mixed up in sin and then everybody's confused and everybody's going, well, I thought it was a real move of God. It was a real move of God. But there are consequences to decisions. And when men and women of God, when men and women of God start playing with sin, it'll make a fool out of them every time. That's why holiness is the goal. This is old school Pentecostal teaching in 2020 terminology. Sin will make a fool out of you. You cannot play with sin. Husbands, you can't play with sin. Wives, you can't play with sin. You can't, you can't stick your toe in the water with sin. Come on, the, the, the monster that lives in the lake will grab your foot and drag you in. You can't, you can't pity, you can't pity pat with sin indefinitely. Sooner or later, it'll make a fool out of you. And the problem is the anointing that's on your life for a move of God or for whatever you're doing in your life. Sometimes that anointing will keep you in that move while you are in sin, because that is a season of grace in your life where God is hoping that you will repent, not say you're sorry, but will turn from what you're doing and then it can perpetuate. But sooner or later, that grace has an end point, not necessarily for your salvation, but for what God can use because sooner or later, God's grace is gonna slow down in that area and everything you do 
do privately will be exposed publicly and then the entire thing will be disrupted and the devil will have victory again and everybody will be confused and they'll say, I thought it was a move of God and I'll be over here saying it was a move of God, but you can't play with sin just because God is moving. We got, we got too many teachers and preachers that are teaching the idea of a decision to follow Christ. It is not just a decision to follow Christ. It is a full tilt conversion to follow Christ. Your old life is laid down. You pick your new life up. And if you don't do that, listen to me very carefully. You are trampling the blood of Jesus Christ under your feet. You are taking the spotless blood of the Lamb of God that was, that was shed on Calvary's cross that ran down from the pores of his head down his naked body into the ground to pay the price for your sins. And when you stay in sin and you make excuse after excuse after excuse for it, you are trampling the precious blood of Jesus Christ under your feet and the grace on your life will come to an end before it is over we will get to heaven and there will be many people that are shocked about who is not there and there will be many people that are shocked about who is there I didn't think they would make it what's the difference they believe God they may have been struggling, but they were hiding under the shadow of his wings. You can't, you can't act like you're one thing or the other. Your acting will find you out. Sin will make an absolute fool out of you. Sin will make a fool out of you. Sin will take, and then it affects everybody that you've ever ministered to. Come on, there, there's enough criticism. You wouldn't believe it, but some people even criticize me. Some people send in messages. I think, my God, that's not what I said at all. We don't need to give any more fuel to the fire. Holiness is for you. Holiness is an abstaining. The Bible says to know what is right and to not do it to him. That is sin. And sin is what got Jesus on the cross. And when we stay in that setback and that folly and we keep returning to it like a dog returns to its own vomit, we are trampling the blood of Jesus under our feet. We're making the cross of Christ despised. We're making it unnecessary in our life. We're turning our back on the sacrifice that he made for us. This is what it is. This is the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You come to him because he is good and you stay with him because he is good. And there are certain things that we abstain from. We just don't do them. The, the biggest hit list is the Ten Commandments. That, th those were not the Ten Commandments that expired at the end of the book of Malachi. Those are the Ten Commandments. They're not Jewish commandments. Those are biblical commandments. So for you and for me, we got to get to the place where we realize I'm not going to get under the shadow of sin because sooner or later you will run out of the, of the grace season. And I'm not talking about your salvation. You work that out with fear and trembling. But there is a season of grace where you start to peel off of what God's called you to do, what God's called you to be. You start tick, uh, sticking your toe in the water. You start doing these things. And there's a season of grace where God's going, no, 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 come on back. Come on back. Jesus leaves the 99, starts coming after you but if you keep running in that direction God is not going to grab you and drag you back you have to decide to follow Jesus and it is dropping all the other nets you've been dragging around your whole life that have been indiscriminately picking up junk the whole way until sooner or later you get to the place where you get so close to him and you just go though he slay me Yet will I serve him. You, they, Jesus looked at the disciples one day and said, all these other people left me. You're going to leave me too. 
And so, well, where would we go? Come on, does anybody just have that, where would I go? I mean, think about it. What, what, who else delivers? Who, who else sets free? Who else can I run to and be safe? Who else is a strong tower? Who else descended into the depths of hell on my behalf? Only to come out carrying the keys and all authority, willing to hand them over to me. Maybe you've never given your life at that level. Maybe, maybe you've been playing pity pat your whole life. Maybe, maybe you like the idea of Jesus. Maybe somebody convinced you he was some soft, passive individual when the reality is he is the epitome of strength walking around. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've never considered giving your whole life. Maybe you never looked at it and did a legitimate inventory. What's different about me because I serve Jesus? What, what, what is different about me? What, what is different? What do I do because I serve Jesus? What do I not do because I serve Jesus? I just wonder, are we resting under the wrong shadow? Because I'll tell you, there is a heat when you follow him. Persecution, friends that you used to do all these things with, now all of a sudden, it's not like they hate you. They just don't call you anymore because you no longer sit around the keg all night in front of your children and act like that's normal. In the job site, you're not as popular at the water cooler because you stopped talking about the boss. The Bible says blessing and curse can't come out of the same well. Blessing and curse can't come out of the same mouth. You stop cursing the job that God actually gave you. And now you're not as popular at the water cooler. You, you, you get to your family gathering and, and they start feasting on the godly. They start talking about ministers on TV or they start talking about churches or they start talking about anything and you respectfully, as respectful as you can, you gather your children and you go to your home and on the way home you say, now listen to me, babies. We do not speak ill of God's people. We never know when we will need grace and you will reap what you sow we do not speak ill of the people of God. And you make that your stance. Maybe you've never considered what's different about my life. Maybe you've never considered what's different about my computer. Because I serve God. Maybe you've never considered what's different about what I post online. Because I serve God. Why do I know the lyric to every song on the top 40, but I can't quote three scriptures? Well, I don't listen to that kind of music. Why do I know the top, the lyric to every top 10 song on the country charts, but I don't know three scriptures? Am I under the wrong shadow? Well, where am I hiding? Because you're hiding somewhere. All of us. Are you hiding under the wings of the Almighty? Or is it something else? Because for this church, I'm telling you, unequivocally, we are taking over. And we are not going to stop. With my last breath, I will be saying, love people and point them to Christ. 
With my last breath, I will be saying, God is a healer. With my last breath, I'll be saying, God will deliver you. With my last breath, I'll be saying, don't pay attention to what you see. Pay attention to his book. And it's a shift that when you begin to recognize it, now all of a sudden you begin to see that this new level, this new season, it's going to cost you more than the last one. King David said it like this. He said, I don't want to give God anything. It didn't cost me something. I don't want to give God anything that didn't, that didn't have value to me. When's the last time you turned the TV off at 6 and said, from 6 to 10, there'll be no television. I want to read some of his Bible, and I want to just think about what it said. That's what he meant when he said meditate on his word day and night. Let his word be hidden in your heart, written on the tablets of your soul. What, what would your life look like if you began to confess your word is more precious to me than the air I breathe? Did you know God will invade your home? Did you know God would invade your kitchen table? So how do I do it, Pastor? Just like this. You say, hey guys, let's pray. And then you put your hands on your children, your wife, your husband, and you pray. God, I thank you for my family. I thank you that you've anointed us. Please open our eyes to the opportunities to serve you at a higher level. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for equipping us. Thank you for hiding us under the shadow of your wings. Make a residency in our home, Lord Jesus. Let your presence never leave. We love you. We love you. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When do I do it? Every time it crosses your mind. And if it doesn't cross your mind, then you set a reminder in your phone to pray at 6 o'clock with your family so that it goes off. You set a reminder for everything else. You set a reminder. So this day's not going to go by without me praying. I'm done with the I'm so tired I can't stay awake to finish my prayer prayer at night. I'm done with it. You make a decree and then you follow it. Because we're building a bigger shadow and we need everybody in one mind. Come on, somebody. In one accord, we need everybody pushing in one direction. Because at the end of this thing, we're gonna see, we're gonna see God do things. I, I, I guess I could say it like this: We're standing on generations of prayers right now. Some of you, your parents prayed, but they died before they saw it. I can take you to Hebrews chapter 11 and teach you how many heroes of faith, matter of fact, the greatest heroes of faith, oftentimes didn't even get to say what they were prophesying. My grandparents pastored for 50, almost 60 years. And you're seeing what many of them prayed for. My grandfather's widow tithes to this church and sends letters. I'm so thankful to see what God is doing. Oh my God, your grandfather would be so proud because we're standing on the prayers of others. But if we act like it's common, if we act like it's common, See, the challenge is, the challenge is, 
How can we get so close to him but not lose a grip on the society we're trying to change? Because when we build a bigger shadow, you hear it all the time. People drive in. They say, oh, my God. I said, I don't know. Something happened when I drove by. I just had to come. I could name six people right now. I think I could at least name six people right now that have said those exact words to me over the years. I just drove by. I had to go. Pulled in. Their whole life gets changed. They're faithful as a clock. Just come back around. And that, the shadow we cast now I mean, this is a nice place. I thank God for it. But there, somebody say there. There's going to be a new tabernacle. And it's going to be one that not only will the anointing draw people, its beauty is going to draw people. Its, its size is going to draw people. So, as we're going into this new season, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm, I'm asking as fervently as I can, what is different about you than somebody that's not born again? I'm not talking about whether or not you're going to go to heaven. Because when you get to heaven, you're done. You can't do anything for God in heaven. Everybody in heaven is saved already. So my question is very sincere. What's different about your life? What do you do that unsaved people don't do? What do you not do that unsaved people do? What do you do that when you're done with it, you feel less than? What do you do that when you do it, you know you have pleased God? I'm talking about building a bigger shadow and I'm talking about a group of people, a call to arms in this region. Where we decide my whole life, Jesus, not a part of it, not a fragment, not a segment, not a moment, not because I felt you and I didn't feel you the next day so I didn't. I'm talking about your whole life. Don't you just want to give your life for something? Don't you just want everything when your book is written for him to say, that was a life well lived. Don't you want to get to heaven and have people go, I heard about you. Don't you want to get to heaven and be mobbed by the people whose life you impacted? that say, thank you for telling me about Jesus. He's better than I ever imagined. Sat with my children the other day. I said, we're about to minister to this waiter. What's the best thing we can say right now? One said this, one said this, one said this. I said, watch this. I said, everything they said, and the man was crying by the end of the conversation. I said, look, the hand of God is waiting on the people of God to take a step. God's not going to do it a different way than he did in the Bible. Jesus himself showed up to one man, a guy named Saul, after the ascension. After that, before that, during that, it's people just like you, just like me. It said, I'm not going to let the sun go down without telling somebody about my king. Some call us evangelicals. Some call us Pentecostal. Some refuse to call us Pentecostal. <laughs> Some call us charismatic. I just want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christ one. I want to know him. I want to be used by him. I want to see his hand move. And I want to build him a bigger shadow in this region.